Welcome to Study with the Vest, the magazine show about CUNY. I'm Tina Beth Pina. On today's show, we're going to look at athletics. From the godmother of Title IX to the voice of the New York Islanders and Mets, we've got the CUNY sports angle covered. Now, back in the day, I used to run track in college, and being a female collegiate athlete was really no big deal since there were several others out there like me. But before 1972, a woman competing in an organized sport in high school, let alone college, was unheard of. I can't imagine what the world would be like for a female athlete without it. If it wasn't for talent, I don't think I would have the same opportunities as, as men. I think having the opportunity um, is definitely taken for granted if you don't know the story behind it. No person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. And that says it all. Meet Bernice Sandler, the godmother of Title IX, whose courage and conviction forever changed the lives of millions of young women, including me. I remember saying, oh, isn't this nice? It's covering athletics. It means on field day, the girls will have more activities. You really did not know it was going to shift the entire field of higher education and lower education. It's the most important law passed for women and girls since women got the right to vote in 1920. We just had no idea. Congress also had no idea what the larger impact of Title IX would be when the bill was first introduced. When the bill was passed, it was what we call now a stealth bill, uh, a group of us went to Representative Green, who's the mother of Title IX, I'm the godmother, but she's the mother of it, uh, and we said, tell us what you want us to say. We're ready to lobby the Congress and the Senate. Just tell us you know, who we should get to and what we should say. And she said, I don't want you to lobby. She said, if you lobby, people will ask what's in this bill. And if they find out what's in this bill, they won't vote for it. And she was absolutely right. So it was sort of a quiet, quietly went through the Congress. On July 23rd, 1972, President Richard Nixon signed Title IX into law, which banned sex discrimination in federally funded schools. While Title IX is best known for its impact on high school and collegiate athletics, the original statute made no explicit mention of sports. Any educational activity that receives federal funds of any sort the entire institution is covered. Title IX covers everything, and since nobody was watching, because nobody from the American Council on Education came to testify and examine the bill, we knew it was going to cover athletics. While I benefited from Title IX, the statute was under attack from the athletic establishment in the early 70s. Word gets out, and the collegiate sports establishment is hysterical literally hysterical. Presidents of colleges are being flown in to lobby members of the Congress to either weaken or totally abolish Title IX's coverage of sports. At this point, the women's groups go into action, uh, and we even had some buttons printed, uh, God bless you, Title IX, and give women a sporting chance. There were, I believe, 12 bills introduced in the Congress to cut down Title IX's coverage of sports. All of them lost. Ah, and we were very pleased. Since Title IX was implemented, female participation in high school sports has risen more than 900%. On the college level, it's risen over 450%. Initially seeing these huge jumps just seemed wonderful. But then when you compare it to men, and incidentally, the, the, the rumor was that Title IX was gonna kill men's sports. Men's sports have increased continuously since Title IX. Women's sports have increased more because they were so far behind and so they're catching up. There still aren't the same kinds of, of opportunities, the same number of opportunities or percentage of opportunities that women should be having. And I was very fortunate that Title IX gave me the opportunity to pursue my academic and athletic dreams that started in grade school, continued through high school, and eventually helped me to get a scholarship to Lafayette College. All I ever wanted to do was run like the wind, like my idol Wilma Rudolph 
and I had absolutely no idea the amount of work that went on behind the scenes to make college and high school athletics for women a reality. Last year was the 40th anniversary of Title IX, and I did a tremendous amount of thinking of all the people who helped me, because you never do this by yourself. But it is amazing to me, I mean, and I am still thrilled to, to meet women who are doing athletics. It's, I mean, it's just because I know I played a role in it, and, it's, and it's, it is very exciting. Luckily, not having access to athletic teams as a female has never been an issue for most people in my generation, so I feel like it's been a positive change for the better. Growing up, I always played sports, and the opportunities and memories that I've created through sports is so special to me and cherished, and to think that there were female athletes in generations prior to mine that didn't have those opportunities simply based on the fact that they were female is a lot harder to understand. Do you think Title IX has done its job? Is it no longer needed? Some people say that. They really believe that all the discrimination has ended. It certainly has not. Title IX has, it's been a revolution in higher and lower education. There's no question about that. Uh, but uh, there are still many things that we need to do. Title IX has recently required fair treatment for pregnant and parenting students and has protected undergrads from bullying and sexual harassment. So the law is still functioning in more ways than even Bernice or any of her supporters ever thought imaginable. I was incredibly naive as to how social change occurs. I really thought we would say, we would say to someone, you know, that's discrimination and would you please stop and they would say oh I'm so sorry of course I won't discriminate anymore and that would be taken care of so I thought one year was about all we needed to tell people that they were discriminating uh, at the end of the year I raised my estimate to about two years and then the next time I raised it I said it's going to take about at least five and then I went to ten uh, and then at some point I realized this was not going to happen in my lifetime or the lifetime of any young people that I know because what we're talking about is a social revolution on your mark. Kids shouldn't grow up feeling that they're different. Kids should grow up feeling that they're kids. You know, the good part is that we're able to catch them at a young age. We're able to show them that sport is available to them. We can show them that they can compete and they can play like they're able-bodied peers. They're called the Wheelchair Sports Federation of Sled Hockey Team. And they're kids with disabilities. My job happens to be the commissioner of the mayor's office for people with disabilities. I want to show these kids that they can, they can be the commissioner of the mayor's office for people with disabilities. It's really that simple. They can. I just want to let everybody know that I'm seeing a lot of good improvement on people skating. I see all the kids develop tremendously. If we look at the kids team that we started back last season, the kids were being pushed around. They couldn't even push the sled. Now they're pushing themselves. They're more involved. They're more involved with their friends. Build your self-confidence. It allows you to compete. It builds camaraderie. So it does so many different things. And overall, it just makes you feel good. No, I wasn't always in a wheelchair. Um, back in 1994, the year the Rangers won the Stanley Cup, I was uh, downhill mountain biking with my friends in uh, Forest Park. And uh, I flew over my handlebars into a tree, and I injured my spinal cord. Moved my fingers, and I went to move my toes, and I knew I was paralyzed right there. And, uh, when I first got hurt, I didn't particularly want to live. I didn't think wor life was worth living. And then as time goes on, and you start seeing that, and you realize that you can. It's like, wow, it's life. It's worth living. It's, it's everything. It's great. Paralympics are simply, and it's parallel, it's next to the Olympics. That's what the Paralympics mean. And it's for physically disabled athletes, and they compete and train in the same facilities as Olympic athletes do. Without my disability, I wouldn't have been able to travel the world the way I was. And it was all because of sport. People's perception, when they see people with disabilities, uh, you, know, you tell them, hey, you know, I competed in the Paralympic Games. They're like, oh, how nice. You know, how nice that is. And you know, they give you a pat on your back, and some people even pat you on your head. It's like, you have no idea what it's like. You have no idea what it's like to, to, to overcome something and be able to compete at a high level. The kids team that we put together, they don't have to worry about getting the pat on their back or the pat on their head. It's like, no, I'm here, I'm an athlete. This is what I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be this the rest of my life and I'm gonna overcome anything that you put in my way. Now, again, good job. Now skate, Evan, skate. Evan, nice pass, really nice pass. Sled hockey was the thing that sort of immediately caught my son's attention. And we met Victor Khaleesi there, and he brought a sled for Sam the first day. 
And on that first day, Sam skated for two hours straight nonstop, and he couldn't stop talking about it. A lot of our players and kids don't have a lot of other opportunities to interact with other disabled kids. When you're disabled, you rely on other people to help you in lots of different things. And sort of like I said before, when he gets there on the ice and he's just skating by himself, he doesn't need my help, he doesn't need his mom's help, he's just skating. What I would like the kids to take away from their sled hockey team is that they're confident and they can do anything they want. And they can have careers and they can, they can excel in life. Let's go Rangers! It has changed my son's life. It's changed, it's changed all these kids' lives. It's changed all their parents' lives. He's finally on a team like all his friends. It has made an unbelievable impact on his life. Move it, Michael, move it. Move it. Last night when he was going to bed, he said, Mom, I finally got my first trophy. How great is that? Powerful stuff. Keep going. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. All right. New York City has been home to some of the greatest moments in sports history, and our Andrew Falzone spent some time with one man who has broadcast some of the best. Coming to a Mets game is a rite of passage for any kid growing up in Queens. Howie Rose grew up in Bayside and graduated from Queens College in 1977. He now gets to live out his childhood dream at every Mets and Islanders game, whether they're at home or on the road. Three separate one goal leads. The thrill of describing the big moment. You know, there's nothing like a postseason game, and there's nothing like calling an overtime goal or a game winning hit or a home run. But just being in that moment never, ever gets old. And Howie Rose has made a career out of being a part of some of the biggest moments in New York sports history. He's been on air with the New York Mets since 1995 and currently doing the team's radio telecasts on WFAN. He's also the play-by-play -play broadcaster for the New York Islanders on MSG Networks. And before that, he did play-by-play -play for the New York Rangers on radio. When I was in junior high school in the summer of 1967, I was 13 years old, and I had become a huge Ranger fan the previous season. And maybe the biggest reason I became a Ranger fan was Marv Albert. Hearing Marv do that game just blew me away. And I said, aha, this is it. I want to do this. How he started the Marv Albert fan club and became the sportscaster's teenage protege, how he would supply a demo tape, and Marv Albert would supply the mentorship. He would listen to my tapes and give me tremendous constructive criticism, never patronizing, always helpful, always willing. Um, I just can't say enough about Marv. What was your first gig out of college and how did you land it? I actually landed it with Marv's help while I was in college, right here at Queens. I was very involved in helping run the radio station. When I walked into the office at that station one day, in 1975, I got a note in the mailbox that said, please call Bob Meyer. Now, I'd known that name, but I couldn't really place it. And then I realized, hmm, Bullet Bob Meyer, Marv's longtime statistician. Bullet Bob was recruiting Howie to join a startup called Sports Phone, which provided scores by phone in an era before smartphones. Howie admits he was unusually lucky in his career. While most sports broadcasters work their way to a major market, he spent nearly all four decades working in New York. He's probably best known for calling the goal that sent the Rangers into the Stanley Cup Finals in 1994. Oh my goodness, I'd never heard myself that out of control and I was a little embarrassed and a little scared about how it was going to be received. And it wasn't until I left the building and drove home and heard the reaction and had people stop me on the street outside the garden even before I got to my car that I knew they'd at least latched onto it. But I, I kind of figured that was just part of their exuberance at the moment. But it carried over the next day or so when people were calling up as much to talk about the call as they were the goal that I got comfortable enough to think, well, okay, I guess they liked it, so I'm all right with it. 
and when baseball and hockey seasons overlap, Howie rarely has a moment to himself. And I'll meet you in Boston okay. Thursday. Yeah. It's not just the games. It's the travel. It's the preparation. It's everything that goes into getting ready to produce a telecast and to be on the same page and to get along and to know that you can really ride each other when the opportunity presents. That, believe me, goes a long way. Now part of the fabric of New York sports history, he's always looking forward to that next big call, whether it's on the field or on the ice. The fact that you're not only charged with describing the big moments, you don't know when they're coming or where they're coming from. It's the best. I always was more comfortable in the water. You swim, you just shut off everything. As a child, it was always something like meditation for me. I had to train a lot long distance, and I tell myself stories in the water. It's like I'm inventing stuff. My head is spinning. You can't breathe whenever you want. You have to wait for your moment to get your oxygen in. That's really hard to do, and the whole coordination. You have to have kind of like the core needs to adapt to the water. A lot of kids, when they fight the water, it's not going to work. You need to first relax. It's like making it possible for these little human beings to enjoy in a complete different world. They are much more mobile in the water because they don't have the weight on it. It's just one tenth of their original weight on land. They can make connections in their little brains. Not possible on land. I'm glad to just have the opportunity to show them, show them this world. I love to see them enjoying it or see overcome their fear and going under with them. And usually in my classes, they're happy to go under. Some of them are really come up smiling. I grew up in Berlin. Um, I'm not born in Berlin, but I grew up there. When the wall fell, everything changed. The people changed too. We were all sitting in one boat and all had the same fate. So we're kind of like connected with each other and we were treating each other a lot like that too. You would help each other out. And after the wall fell, that changed. You know, it was more like, like competition. My coach just disappeared, so I tried to change the coach and didn't get, a, didn't get along with the next coach and then that all caused me to stop swimming. It was a, that was a difficult time for me. I kind of like um, lost my way for a while. You know, it's like um, you have been always something special and then not anymore. I had, a, I had not a life as an athlete anymore. That's why I'm enjoying it now. right before the race starts, it's like you have that, that, that energy, you know, building up, building up, building up, more, 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 and, and you need to, it needs to get out. It doesn't matter how demanding that race is or that competition is right now, or I take every race serious, no matter what. I think I'm the born competitor. I always want more of myself, you know. It's not only about the winning, it's improving yourself. Welcome back to Study with the Best. From Muhammad Ali to Mike Tyson, boxers have long answered the call to Gleason's gym. And one Queensboro photographer went to Gleason's to train and stayed to take pictures. All my life I grew up watching boxing with my family on Friday nights uh, in uh, San Francisco. All my father's friends would come over on Friday nights and they would watch Gillette Cavalcade of Sports and these guys would all talk and bet on every round and talk a lot of trash. This place is really alive. It's the magic of it is still here. What's your name? Jules. Alan. I'm Iran Barker. No, no, no. Oh, <laughs> so I saw you fight a lot, man. My name is Jules Allen. I'm a photographer, and I teach at Queensboro College in New York. 
I'm interested in social aspects of life, of living. I, I like the way people move in the gym and have to pay attention and be alert. I like all the, the movement of the bags, the rhythm and the, uh, I like the sound of it, you know? It's beautiful to watch, man. It's beautiful to watch. The photographs that I make are about African-American culture in, in effect. I mean, being responsible and mature. I mean, I hate photographs of black people sitting around being dependent, victimized, uh, criminalized. I can't stand that type of imagery. So you aren't going to shut it down, but you can counter it. This is a book that was shot in Gleason's gym between 1983 and 1986 when uh, Gleason's was on 30th. The book was published in 2011. You can't just walk in here with a camera and start photographing. I had to be part of a community. My uh, trainer, Bobby McQuillan, he said, uh, what do you do? And I said, I photograph. And he said, whatever you do, if you train with me, you'll be better at it. The crazy part is he was right. <laughs> uh, he improved my focus. His name is Rodney Watts. I boxed Rodney for three rounds. And the only reason that I'm here today is Rodney had mercy on my soul. <laughs> this is a gentleman, Rocky. We argued for two years. And I used to uh, mess with him all the time, tell him he didn't know what he was talking about. He raised up his pant leg, and there was a pistol in his ankle. I said, you crazy. And we laughed about it, but uh, he carried it everywhere he went. This is great to see that this has been able to sustain itself. You know what I mean? In, in, in trying times and troubled times, that this gym is still holding up and that it's uh, boxing is uh, embraced this way. Thanks for watching Study with the Best. For all things CUNY, log on to our website at cuny.edu or you can Facebook and tweet us at CUNY TV. In 2012, the City College of New York women's soccer team received the CUNY Athletic Conference's first ever NCAA Women's Soccer Tournament Automatic Qualifier. But City College did not achieve this on its own. In order to get automatic qualification, a conference requires seven competing institutions. The CUNY Athletic Conference helped achieve this by adding four teams in only two years to reach seven institutions. The City College women's soccer team won the CUNY AC Championship and, as a result, earned an NCAA berth.